Good day and welcome to JB Pharma's Q1 FY23 earnings conference call as on 5th of August 2022. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Jason De Souza, Vice President at JB Pharma. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Welcome to the earnings call of JB Pharma. We have with us today the management of JB Pharma, Mr. Nikhil Chopra, CEO and Old Time Director, and Mr. Lakshay Kataria, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Kunal Khanna has taken ill today, and as a result, is not able to attend this call. Before we begin, I would like to state that some of the statements in today's discussion may be forward-looking in nature and may involve certain risks and uncertainties. A detailed statement in this regard is available on the Q1 FY23 results presentation that has been sent to all of you earlier. I would like to hand over the floor to Mr. Nikhil Chopra to begin the proceedings of the call and give his opening remarks. Thank, thank you, Jason. And, uh, and good afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone joining us today for the discussion on the operating and the financial performance for JP Pharmaceutical during Q1 FI23. I shall commence with a review of our first quarter performance and share some thoughts on our business. Later on, our CFO, Mr. Lakshya Kataria, will continue with the financial highlights. After our remarks, we would be glad to engage with all of you over a discussion. Uh, gentlemen, we are uh, uh, all on the call. We are pleased to report a healthy growth in top line, underlined by strong sustained trends in the domestic business and complemented by robust improvement in our international business. It is heartening that we have been able to deliver this performance despite the challenging operating environment. During Q1 FI23, revenues on a reported basis increased to increase by 30% year on year to INR 785 crore. Domestic formulations delivered good growth and crossed a revenue of 400 crores in a quarter. This is this is this is all-time high revenue that we have generated for India business as as on today. Organic growth for domestic business was in mid-teens as compared to flat growth as reported in IPM for quarter one. We continue to be the fastest growing company among the top 25 as per IQA met June 22 data. Our approach on enhancing field force productivity is yielding intended results. So also our focus on driving our chronic business. As we nurture our new product launches in the adjacent therapies, our big brands continue to get bigger. Just to give you some perspective, our brands like Metrogil, Silakati, Nikadia have each further improvement their rankings within top 300. JB Pharmaceuticals has also announced its prescription ranking and now stands to number 15 in IPM as per IQ. And also happy to report that JB's prescription base increased from 2.6 crore prescription in quarter one FI22 to 4.09 crore in F in FI in quarter one FI23, growing at 57%. Uh, just to give brief highlights on what has been happening in our in, in our inorganic business that we acquired in last six to eight months. Likewise, portfolio, product portfolio from Senzyme has performed well, whereas in Sporolac, uh, which is a leading brand in Senzyme, we have seen market share gains. Asmara represents an extension of our leadership portfolio in the cardiology segment. Heart failure is relatively a new sub-segment and we under uh, so we are presently in the investment mode for Asmara and, and are witnessing a, witnessing good results month on month. Our teams on the ground are fully geared up with with an end-to-end -end portfolio from hypertension to the prevention of heart failure. In keeping with our outline strategy to be present in high potential categories, 
we have also completed the acquisition of four pediatric plants. On a combined basis, this account for rupees 33 crore in sales in FI22. This acquisition will provide JB a comprehensive portfolio with well-known brands to cater the to cater pediatrician as a specialty. It will increase our market coverage and align with our go-to-market model. Moving along, our international operations have demonstrated a healthy uptick in focus markets. South Africa is showing attraction in the generic segment across both public and private market. We are also seeing robust demand in tenders and new launches in private market in South Africa. Russia and CIS has shown a stable demand trend. Given the daily challenges, as all of you are aware, in the geopolitical realities, we continue to have cautious approach, and I'm happy to note that our receivables position is positive. In the CMO segment, we enjoy global leadership in the world of lozenges, more so in herbal and medicated varieties. We have grown the scope of our relationship with our key clients to continue new product development in both lozenges and liquid formulations during FI, during quarter one FI23, uh, as, 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 as we reported. Also happy to share that we could surpass a, re a revenue of 100 crores for F quarter one FI23 in the world of CDMO segment, which is ever highest that we have achieved. With a strong order book position, we are in a comfortable position to drive this business further. The CMO business tends to be front loaded with first two quarters of the financial year performing better than the later half. We are pleased with the progress that we have made in last two years in transforming our company and business. There's a scope to further improve our share in the domestic market through a combination of better growth in core therapies, whereas we are continuing to support the line extensions and, develop, and developing new brands. The emphasis on growth is clearly coming across with operating parameters building up as per planned. Our aspiration in domestic market is to make our big brands bigger, focus on both market share and prescription gains for our acquired portfolio and organic portfolio, Target, targeted focus life cycle management in existing brands and pursue new brand launches which we we'll continue to do as, as committed. There is an exciting opportunity to, to be had in the international operation as well where we have selective, selective approach and are focusing on identified, identified geographies as well. In case of international market, we will continue to benefit from consistent execution in the world of CMO segment through new launches as well as adding new partners, healthy mix between private and public market in South Africa, and continued demand revival in selected ROW markets. As the top line growth accelerates and the business mix enhances, we shall see a transition into maintaining or increasing our EBITDA margins given our disciplined focus on cost optimization initiatives. That brings me to, on, to, to the conclusion of my remarks, and I would like to call upon now Mr. Lakshay to share his views more on the financial performance for the quarter. Over to you, Lakshay. Thank you, Nikhil. A very good afternoon to all of you, and welcome to our Q1 earnings call. I will now take you through the financial highlights of the quarter. On the revenue front, the domestic business and international business reached new highs during the quarter. The reported revenue growth of 30% comprised of 20% organic growth and the rest coming through the new acquisitions made last quarter and this quarter. The depreciation in rupee vis a -vis the dollar also aided our growth. Overall, for the quarter, the domestic business reported a revenue of 418 crores and international business reported a revenue of 366 crores, which is a growth both year on year and quarter on quarter. The gross margin for quarter one came in at close to 63% compared to 64% in the previous year. Excluding Asmara, gross margins for the business were relatively flat. The gross margins, as you all know, have taken the impact of inflationary pressure in terms of input costs, packing material costs, which have been managed through a slew of cost management and pricing initiatives. The good news is that we've seen softening in certain packing materials like aluminum and also on the international freight costs. 
But given the continued volatility that we see on the geopolitical and the economic front globally, we continue to monitor the situation, particularly for the fuel supplies and API prices. Overall, we hope to sustain the gross margin closer to 64% for the fiscal, with the March improvement coming through in Asmada margins on the expiry of LOE. Given the high inflation prevailing across the world, we've been trying to maintain our operating margins in the range of 24 to 26%, and this quarter's operating margin was in line with our guidance. On the EBITDA front, the Q1 FI23 operating EBITDA was at 190 crores, including an adjustment for non-cash and sub charge of 17 crores. This, when compared to Q1 FI22, operating EBITDA of 164 crores is a growth of 16% year on year. During the quarter, the employee expenses, excluding ESOP charges, have increased by 19%. On account of the annual increments and the integration of the workforce from acquisitions. Operating expenses have now largely normalized with the normalization of operations post-COVID, baking of operating expenses of acquired businesses, and increase in freight and power and fuel expenses. Depreciation during the quarter was at an elevated level due to amortization of acquired brands. The pack for the quarter came in at 105 crores, which saw a year-on-year decline of 12% on account of higher treasury income in the previous year, non-cash ESOP cost, which was not present in the same quarter last year, depreciation of the acquired grants and financing cost. On the cash flow generation also, I'm happy to report the business continued its strong trajectory. Overall, we ended with a debt of 325 crores, which was largely to fund the acquisition of Asmada. And on the cash front, cash and investment front, we ended with cash of over 180 crores compared to 56 crores last quarter. That's all from my side for now. We would now like to open this forum for an interactive session with all of you, and we'll be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Participants to ask a question, please press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Nikhil Mathur. Sorry, uh, the first question is from the line of Rahul Jiwani from IAFL Securities Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, now, on the CMO business, we saw very good traction this quarter. So, if you can just comment on what led to the growth on the CMO business. Uh, this quarter in terms of uh, which clients and which markets contributed to growth. And then the second part on the CMO business is uh, you have indicated that uh, the, the CMO revenue tends to be front-loaded in 1H of every year. Uh, but last year in fiscal 22, the second half was heavier for the CMO business. So given uh, the growth which you have seen on the CMO business in 1Q, what is your uh, outlook for the CMO business for the full uh, fiscal 23. Yes, Rahul. This is Nikhil Chopra. So overall, we see we saw the demand coming across all the markets outside India because this, this CDMO business, what we do is uh, outside India. And this was overall uh, more happened because of the upsurge in the in, in, because of the cough and cold, uh, cough and cold in uh, uh, which 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 where our major dominant portfolio is. Equally, uh, if, you, if you look at in quarter, quarter four last year, we could see this surge happening, which is continued in quarter one. And as, as I see, because these all businesses we do with all the multinational partners and for them, 
quarter three of ours is the last quarter for them. So the orders for the way we are seeing trajectory this year, that the orders for our CDMO business is more front loaded. That is that is that is what we see and that is what I commented that that we have a robust order book for at least next three to three to four months. And overall, as the year end comes and and Christmas comes in, uh, there 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 we see overall the de uh, demand overall being tepid, and they they keep enough stocks uh, to cater the market. Uh, guidance for overall year for freedom of business. Uh, the way trajectory we are looking at, and this year, this this quarter, we could touch 100 crores. We will we will we will continue to see uh, plus minus 10 percent demand coming for which which we have uh, order book for next three to four months. And uh, overall, the contribution that Raul we have been talking from this business, which was last year 10 percent, and this year we are seeing this business contribution should be close to around 13 to 14 percent for overall business. That is what I can say at this moment of time. Okay, sir. So, so you are saying that FY23, the CDMO business contribution to full year revenues will be around 13, 14 percent. Yeah. Sure, sir. Uh, and sir, second question on the India business. Uh, you spoke about uh, the organic growth for our India portfolio being mid-teens. Uh, but if you can also comment uh, qu quantitatively on how Sanzaim and Asmada uh, have grown during the quarter. Because on Sanzaim, you have been trying to implement this uh, prescriber overlap as well as geographical synergies which you see between your and uh, Sanzaim portfolio. So anything which you could highlight on uh, the growth trends for both uh, Sanzaim and Asmada? So overall, both the assets, uh, Rahul, uh, which is a combination of Sanzaim, let me start with Sanzaim, uh, we are seeing a monthly rendering of around 12 to 13 crores. And uh, this is showing a growth of mid to high teens. That is what I can say at this moment of time. And the uh, overall plan that we have put in place uh, with three Three benefits that we enjoyed JBS compared to Senzaim as an entity was more from a prescriber base, more from a geographical footprint, and equally life cycle management. So we have started seeing some benefits coming coming out of geographical footprint and prescriber base. More from life cycle management, you should see a couple of more products coming into the market in next two to three months. That is where we that, that is where we stand from a, from Senzaim as a as a as an entity. Equally, when you look at Asmada, our, our uh, monthly run rate is now around close to 7 to 8 crores. That is where we stand. More so, uh, we are trying to, we are in an investment mode, as uh, Lakshya stated. Uh, more so, in terms of uh, looking at how much more we can get patient pool and more and more patient getting diagnosed. Because, as you as you are aware, last time also I had commented that. Uh, the incidence of heart potential uh, patients in India of heart failure are close to 10 to 11, 11 to 12 million patients, and the treatment today is been, which has been offered, is close to around 15 to 20 percent patients are getting treated. So the emphasis is how more and more number of patients can get diagnosed uh, with the help of 2D and 3D eco. That is the intention, and we have a dedicated teams which who are, who are going and promoting uh, this product to cardiologist and physician, and we are seeing good uptake in terms of uh, more and more patients getting diagnosed, and uh, and the run rate is close to around 7 to 8 crores, which should, which should go up in the coming time. Sure, sir, and just one follow-up on Asmada. So, so anything which you could comment on how the market could form out uh, post the patent expiry in December 22, anything which you would have seen in the Citagliptin market, uh, which you can conclude for Asmada as well. See, there are there are cases in terms of when you when you saw what happened with Vinda Gliptin and now what you are seeing happened with Vinda Gliptin, there are there are more than hundred brands in the market. But what I would like to point out that this is a very as compared to Vinda and Cita Gliptin, uh, heart failure is a very specialized market. Obviously, we will see more than fifty players coming in. Tri erosion will happen, but but. Obviously, the brand uh, brand which stands will have its own value. So we are keeping fingers crossed in terms of uh, the, the overall uh, strategy that we will put in place when the LOE sets in. And right now, 
what is top on the agenda is to how to at least have critical mass of patients who are getting diagnosed and this is overall more beneficial for the patient community and uh, post the LOE sets in, uh, let us look at in terms of uh, where the price sets in because it, it will be overall more benefit for the Indian population who will be getting quality medi medicine at an affordable price and if the if the overall uptake which I'm telling that around 15 to 20 percent population today of the potential people who are suffering are getting the treatment tomorrow it, it may go up to 30 percent 40 percent that is what is going to happen that is what I can say at this moment of time. Thank sure, sir. Just one last question before I join back the queue. Uh, so, so if we look at the comment that our gross margins are flat except of Asmada, then that implies that Asmada has impacted our gross margins by 150 to 160 basis points. But at least the calculations which I am working with, uh, per my calculations, the impact should have been around 90 basis points. So the impact on account of Asmada seems to be higher on the gross margin side. Uh, so if you can please uh, explain that. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me pick that. Yes, you're right. The impact is actually higher uh, because uh, this was transition period. So, you know, uh, we wanted to make sure there is continuity of supply and we had to incur certain extra cost in terms of air freighting, etc. and sourcing, which we've done to make sure, you know, during the transition period, we do not lose out on the volume. But the impact on gross margin is yes, significantly higher than 90 basis points. Okay, so so going forward, can we expect that the impact would be closer to 100 basis points then on a normalized basis? I think it will take some more time uh, as the inventory sort of transitions as we consume the opening inventory. I think it will probably be Q3 uh, where you'll see some relief. And as we come out of LOE in Q4 is when you will see a significant improvement in the cross margins. Sure, sir. Thank you for answering my questions. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nikhil Mathur from HDFC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, in the capital markets that you boasted, uh, you had mentioned that uh, there's a chance that JV chemicals margins might take a hit in SPI 23 uh, because of the high cost of procurement for, for raw material and, and, and other stuff, uh, which was towards the second half of SPI 22. Uh, but since you mentioned that on a Q and Q basis, the gross margin of stable X of Asmada, uh, just trying to reconcile, uh, there should have been some bit of gross margin hit, right? Or, or why hasn't that happened? Sorry, could you repeat your question? Your question is not clear. What are you asking? Um, I'm asking is that your gross margins are stable on a quarter on quarter basis. Yes. Uh, but in the capital market today, uh, you had highlighted that JB Chemicals which will be working with a higher cost of inventory in SY22 because there was a lot of procurement that was done towards second half of SY22. Uh, so, uh, basis that, shouldn't the cross margins uh, come under pressure in, in, in this particular financial year, but uh, Q1 year supported stable cross margin? So, so, so that is what Lakshya stated earlier that. Uh, when you see the gross margin, which we reported last year, was close to 64 percent. We were at 65. Now. 65 percent, and this this quarter, if you see our gross margin, is close to 63 percent. So there is there is there is a one 1.5 percent uh, dip that we see. Uh, that is what we will see for next uh, next three to four months. And once the LOE expires for Asmara, overall the gross margins will go up in a significant way, and we'll come back to our gross margin trajectory by quarter four. Okay. Sorry, sir, I'm not clear. Uh, in four, you reported 66 percent gross margin. Okay, like uh, I think you, you, uh, the product mix is very different between Q4 and Q1, and thus that comparison is not apt. Okay. So you believe that uh, the impact of uh, higher raw material cost is, is, is there in this particular quarter? Yeah, that's what we stated, that higher raw material cost is there in the quarter. Okay. And sir, uh, you also had given a, a bit of margin guidance of 24 to 26 percent uh, for FY23. Uh, now that now uh, you have done 24 percent this particular quarter, and they have also mentioned that you are starting to see some uh, some things starting to soften now. Uh, so can it be assumed that uh, uh, from 2Q onwards, the margin uh, could possibly towards the higher end of this range? See, Nikhil, if you look at our operating EBITDA margin is still 24% plus. So 
the guidance that we have given is a, is a guidance of range between 24 to 26%. So you will see some quarter 25%, some quarter you will see 26%. We, will be, we can be back to 24%. So that is a rough guidance that we are putting putting across as, 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 because you are living in a very volatile world. Please understand the overall geopolitical issues, the currencies, the receivables, all those things have to be put in place. So somewhere we are seeing some tailwinds in terms of uh, the commodity price going down. Overall, but there, 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 is, there, there are tailwinds in terms of the fuel and gas prices going up. So that up and down will happen, and that is how we want to. That is how we have guided uh, for the for the year 24 to 26 percent margin. Got it, sir. Uh, and so one final question on the acquisitions that that the company is undertaking. So, uh, a pediatric brands from Dr. Eddy, uh, as Mother did. Uh, any synergies that we see with the existing portfolio? Because on the face of it, the multiples seem to be slightly on the higher end of these acquisitions, but can they be complemented with some uh, uh, higher sales of existing portfolio, which can be cross sell by the same set of medical reps? So, Nikhil, a very good question. And uh, if you look at the four brands that we have acquired from, from Dr. Reddy's, uh, they now are being promoted by our team, uh, which are 300 people under the division of NOVA who already are promoting respiratory and pediatric products. So if you look at what we are trying to do is to position ourselves as a company in the clinic of pediatrician, which will be more getting into the world of gut product promotion, which is a combination of Rantec syrup that we have, Exodite syrup that we have, and now we have got ZND. Equally, we have got a uh, brand which is uh, PSEP, which is antibiotic, which, 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 which has got a good starting point. So this will, over a period of time, probably will be able to add more color very initial series that we are into, you will see probably Q, Q3 onwards where we will be able to share more information in terms of how the traction is happening in, in terms of the acquisition that we did of these four brands. Asmada, we have a team, we have a team field force of around 180 to 200 people who are promoting Asmada as a brand and uh, we are looking at one or two product addition that we will do over a period of time uh, within this team, more in the field of cardiology, maybe maybe in the in the world of arrhythmias. So all those synergies will come into place. That is what we are looking forward to. Sure, sir. This is helpful. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to the participants: anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. The next question is from the line of Anubha Agarwal from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Just uh, a couple of clarities. First, uh, the sales force uh, incremental, the total including uh, supervisor, et cetera, has gone from 2100 to 2500. So the Delta 400, uh, Nikhil, you just mentioned, as Mata may be taking 200 uh, Delta. And the remaining 200 is all at uh, Senzyme because I still remember Senzyme when it came to you, they had about 300, 325 people. Can you just clear the maths here? Yeah, so JB is organic. We have got, we were having 2,000 people. 300 people are now as a part of team for Senzyme and 200 people are a part of team of Asmara. So in totality, we have 2,500 people. Okay. And for this acquisition, pediatric acquisition we've done from Dr. Reddy's, what's the payback period you have in mind for that? So generally a payback period is, is six years. That is that is that is what that is what task that we have taken. But but as you see what we are trying to do with Sanzem and Asmara, obviously the aspirations would be much more higher as compared to what we have committed uh, to the board. So we will look at that how we can get it sub five, sub six years. Okay, and the same applies to that uh, pediatric acquisition as well. So we'll see. You should you should track us quarter to quarter. You will get you will you will get to know more in terms of how we are faring. Sure. And for this uh, quarter, when you look at the base uh, products for us, some of the larger uh, uh, products like Rentec and Metrogen, how would they have grown uh, for this quarter? Rough idea. So they are growing uh, low double digit. That is where we stand because last year, if you look at particularly if I have to talk about Rantec as a brand, it was a part of COVID regime and treatment. And uh, today, where we stand, if, and we had a very good season for Metrogy, so we are working now at a very high base of both the products. So low double digit growth is what we could uh, what we could achieve for the quarter. 
so when we look at uh, the base business uh, uh, the uh, the uh, organic growth so silakar would have grown at about uh, high teens to 20% and the uh, rest of the portfolio the rentech metrogen nicardi would have grown about uh, low double digit uh, that's the time uh, uh, framework we can work with so you can look at rentech metrogen nicardi among the 12 to 14% you can you can count on silakar brand going at around 14 to 16% obviously there are other brands also uh there are other 10 potential brands which we never talk about that we have in our kitty uh which are which are in the in the world of just to give you example we have a product called bis for xt which is which is a iron supplement which is a 1 crore brand uh then then uh, we have brands like lexolite zika syrup there are many brands where we are seeing very very good uptake some of the new launches that we have done in the field of respiratory they are also seeing good traction in terms of prescription so overall this is what you can assume 12 to 14% growth for our acute portfolio and close to meeting growth for our chronic portfolio okay and uh, uh, next question is on senzyme uh, how strong is seasonality in this portfolio is uh, second quarter significantly high for this or one is significantly high for this we should see the same traction what you saw in quarter 1 probably quarter 3 onwards overall uh, the demand gets a uh, little bit overall you, you will see things going down but uh, what we are trying to do is we are looking at by that time if we have one or two good products in the terms of life cycle management that we will be putting in the market that is a plan now let us see in terms of how how much you are successful in getting those product at that, that at that time but rightly so first half of the first half of the year is overall a better demand for probiotic as a market so so nikhil uh, how do we look at this molecule track if you do doing run, run it to 12 13 crore so yearly wise uh, give and take 150 crore kind of uh, number we guys can roughly work with for the enzyme portfolio very much so uh, just to clarify that when you are talking of when we are talking about 12 to 13 crore revenue for enzyme portfolio sporo like is uh, around close to 6 to 7 crores there are other parts in the portfolio which is a combination of products for infertility uh, products for stone management uh, there are some supplements so overall probiotic contributes around 60% and 40% we have rest of the portfolio and you are rightly in terms of you should see a revenue traction for the year close to around between 140 to 150 crores for the year uh couple of more questions one is a cmo business so just trying to understand this uh, you mentioned across markets there was a little higher uh, uh, orders from the customers now at the customer end is this restocking of the inventory only or the end market sales they are seeing it higher because uh, now you've seen two quarters uh, which is uh, very high demand obviously the end end, quarter, end end customer demand is on the higher side that has started probably that started sometime i think in mid of last year quarter 4 and that we continue to see uh, probably the stocking part happens in for us calendar year calendar quarter is quarter 2 that is that is how things happen and if the if the end customer demand continues to be there then then it should surprise all of us and nikhil when you talked about this can be 13 14% so like very roughly you, your revenue this year will be about 3000 crore so that uh, roughly are you talking about 380 to 400 crore for the cmo business no 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 we are not talking about 380 400 crore for cmo business so if you understand the the overall orders which come this is this is uh the orders which Between procure for our CMO business are more front front loaded for H1 part of the calendar. As as the festivity and the festive season starts, more so Christmas and in Western part of the world, probably there are holidays for 45 days, 60 days. So that is how they at least look at stocking the products and look at in terms of how they be able to meet the demand. which will start coming for them in quarter 1 which is january which is january onwards then for them january to march is the first quarter and for us january to march is the last quarter so i i don't want to get into any absolute figure on on tomorrow what revenue we will do but the trajectory that we are seeing is we are close to around 83 crore if i am not wrong lakshya for quarter 4 85 crores for quarter 4 100 crores for quarter 1 we should be we we should be close to between these two figures probably in quarter 2 quarter 3 i will be able to more give more color 
probably in our uh, quarter two results commentary. Sure. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rashmi Sancheti from Dalit Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and congratulations on good set of numbers. Uh, just a clarity again on CMO segment. So earlier when you commented uh, 13 to 14 percent uh, of the overall revenues, uh, that is what the CMO segment would contribute. Uh, that basically was not the contribution and was it the growth which you were expecting for FY23? Rashmi, I think when you are modeling the CMO business, Nikhil clearly mentioned that in the first half it is a heavier base and in the latter half it is subdued. So I guess when you are modeling the, the CMO business, it's best to look at a like of a mid-teens growth. That's what I think we are more comfortable with and that's what we've kind of earlier guided to. Okay. And uh, coming to the domestic business, uh, uh, in the presentation it is mentioned that the overall prescription base has become 4.09 crore. Uh, can you just give a split between the GPs and the specialist uh, prescription in this? And how does it look like in uh, Q1 FI22, I mean last year? Exact details, Rashmi, I don't have, but we will, Jason can come back to you, but just to give you a rough Guidance in terms of the way I see is would be, it would be around 60 65 percent GPCP and around 30 35 percent specialist. This is as of today, right? Yeah. I mean, generally 60 to 65 percent is what we are running now, and uh, how does it look like one year back? It would be it would be five five and five seven percent up up. It would, be, it would have been 60 percent. It would be. It would be. It would be 70, 70, 30. That is. So we don't see. Please understand. Then, if you if you want exact details, we'll come back to you. But the reason why we are given prescription, very strong prescription work, that clearly shows the kind of work that is happening at the at the doctor level, and clearly shows how primary sales are also will get impacted because of this higher prescription. That's the reason we have indicated those numbers. Okay. All right. And uh, related to the South Africa sales, uh, can you give the figures like, you know, what kind of growth we have seen and how many launches, uh, you know, we have done in this business? So in South Africa, uh, it's been upwards of 25% growth uh, during the quarter. And both public and private business uh, continue to do well. Overall, from a new product perspective, sorry, I can't share those details on the call. And private public ratio would be 50 50 in this quarter, also. Yes, roughly in that zone. Okay, and my last question is related to debt. Uh, if you can uh, give the figure, you know, for FI22 uh, between long term debt and short term uh, borrowing. So, end of quarter, we had a debt of about 325 crores, of which roughly 300 crores was long term debt, which was taken for acquisition of Asmada, and balance was working capital. And we had a cash and investment of about 180 crores plus at the end of the quarter. Okay, sir. All right. Thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you. A reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star in one at this time. The next question is from the line of Abdul Qadir Puranwala from Ilara. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so my first question is... Uh, so if you can speak closer to the answer, please. Your audio is a bit low. Yeah. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, better. Yes, yeah, sir. So, so my first question is with regards to Osmada profitability. So, uh, you know, when we spoke about the monthly uh, sales of close to 7 to 8 crores, and uh, on the on the gross margin level, uh, you know the entire impact was largely alluded to to uh, to Osmada sales. Uh, would it be fair to assume that uh, uh, you know currently uh, at an EBITDA level, this would uh, still not be a major contributor? Yes, in fact, Abdul, uh, we've been guiding all of you that actually we are in an investment mode. Uh, you know, particularly till the time the LOE expires. So actually, it's a negative EBITDA from the brand as of now. Right. right. So, so I mean, from Q4 onwards, then uh, you know, once the LOE expires, I mean, what is the kind of margin we should expect uh, from this product? 
overall, I think we should aim for at least a company level of EBITDA. And it will, like Nikhil said, obviously there are moving parts. We need to see, you know, how the sizing, etc. pans out. But our minimum aspiration should be that we should do slightly better than the company average EBITDA on this portfolio. Okay. Okay. And so my final question was on the MR count. Uh, so we added close to 400 uh, MRs, uh, 4 to 500 MRs so for these two uh, portfolios would be acquired. So, so for future acquisitions, uh, would you further go to increase your MR count in order to increase your reach or this would be largely absorbed uh, within this existing field force what you have? See, it all depend upon Abdul, the type of opportunity which comes on the table. Uh, for example, let me give example of the four pediatric plants that we acquired. There was no addition of any medical representative on the ground. But equally for a specialized uh, promotion of product in the world of heart failure, you need to have a team because you are by, you are you are you already are running you are already having a re revenue of 60 to 70 crores where we will need people to go and this is a big opportunity according to me heart failure is a disease of next decade so it will all Abdul depend upon the type of portfolio which is whether we can fit that portfolio within our existing business or we want to give it or we see better opportunity in having field force which will give justice to the acquired brands. Understood. Uh, thank you. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gagan Tareja from ASK Investment Managers. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Am I audible? Uh, so if you can speak closer to the device, your audio is a bit low. Yeah. Is, is this better? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the first question is uh, around uh, sacubitral asthma. Uh, uh, Dapagli flows in also has an indication expansion for heart failure uh, and uh, NIH data from US uh, actually shows that Dapagli flows in has better outcomes than Sacubitril. You already have uh, uh, Dapa uh, with you. So I was just wondering, you know, what was, uh, what's the thought process or rationale behind going into Sacubitril as well? See, Dapagliflozin is being promoted by different team, <clears throat> and you are rightly, you are right, absolutely right in terms of Dapagliflozin has a role in, in in patients with heart failure. But we are not a big player in the world of Dapagliflozin, and uh, we are we are making some we are making slow inroads. But if you look at Sacubitril Valsartan, the product has been there in the mark in the in the in US market for last now I think a decade. And Jason, correct me, that was, it's, it's a $4 billion product for Novartis. So it has got a lot of studies and supporting evidence in terms of what what sectoral valves have been on the table as compared to DAPA closing. So that is how we have taken a call of, of looking at the primary therapy in heart failure is going to be sectoral valves and DAPA closing will have its own role. And, 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 and once the, I think the, LOE expires, probably you will see not much difference in the price point of, of both the products. And you may see better uptake of Sacrobital Valsatan, which has got its own benefit and improvement in the quality of life of the patients who are suffering from heart failure. I understand that. So the, the, the reason I was asking was also one more reason I was asking is because these are possibly very comorbid conditions, both diabetes and heart failure. for for a fairly significant chunk of the population, especially in India. So from, from an Indian context, you, you feel uh, uh, what, what worked in US would equally work well in India as well? So if you look at, for a product, uh, which, is, which, which is a patented product, uh, to, to generate a revenue of around 500 crores in four years of its existence in India, itself talks about the strength of the molecule. And there are enough evidence available in Indian population also. And when we are going and talking to the top cardiologists of the country, they are very much they are very much aligned in terms of uh, the stage three and stage four patients of heart failure where they are using uh secular as, as as a starting therapy. And at some given time as the LO expires and the medicine will become more affordable, 
you will start seeing acceptance of uh, secondary valves happen in stage two part of the of the of the journey of the patient also. So, and on on your acquired enzyme portfolio, if you could give us a little more, uh, you know, uh, sort of detailed understanding as to as to how post acquisition Sporlac and Loban and some of the other brands are working out and and you know how you're strategizing around around these because overall you've indicated you know they're growing well healthy at mid teens but is there a difference between how Spolac is picked up and how Loban and the others are, are doing? So there were this entire entity of Senzyme is is into three clusters. Uh, the cluster one is Sporolac and different variants of Sporolac which is 60% uh, of the revenue where we have seen market share gain and quarter one if you look at uh, Sporolac as a brand which has grown at 26% as compared to Bifilac and Vizilac which have grown at around 18-20%. So we are seeing good uptake in terms of prescription for Sporolac and uh, the intention going ahead is uh, what I spoke earlier that how do we at least encash the JB strength of G GPCP prescriber base, uh, which 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 is today very much giving us benefit for Antec and Metrogen as a brand, and equally in next couple of months we should see us see some more variants of Sporolac which will be premium priced to be in the market. That is point number one. Point number two, uh, which I had spoken earlier also. Oxyl and Loban are class probiotic, high price probiotic, more for chronic kidney disease patient and there we are going to nephrologist. The intentions are how do we generate more scientific data and make this brand bigger. This, these are these are brands, these both brands contribute around 15 to 20 percent of the revenue and we are seeing gradual uptake because JB as a company, we cover all 2,000 nephrologists and we have got a very good prescription uptake for nep from nephrologists as a specialty for our Silakar, Silakar T, Nicaria. So there we enjoy equity. Third part, is, third part of this business is business in the world of women health, more so in the world of infertility, which is once again 15 to 20 percent of the revenue, where we have teams who visit around 200 infertility clinics. And there also we are on the verge of doing life cycle management in terms of the portfolio gap that we see. So that should also see overall uptake. Probably it will take more time because this is a highly intensified competitive market where we have very big players who, who, who enjoy better market share. So this is what commentary I can give on behalf on, on what we have observed in last three to four months of operation of Zenzem as entity. Thanks, 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 cousin. Yeah, thank you. I'll get back in the queue. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. The next question is from the line of Ashish from IFLEMC. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so on the CMO business, obviously we have plans to double the scale. Uh, but then uh, would we be sticking to medical lozenges or you feel uh, uh, there's an opportunity for us to diversify when uh, uh, grow the business according, accordingly? So the entire opportunity on the table for CMO business is twofold. <clears throat> First is how do you widen your portfolio and earlier also what I have, I have shared that uh, we want to we want to venture into areas like uh, sleep disorders, motion sickness, oral thrush, sexual wellness, asyptic disorders. So there are some proof of concepts which we have developed and we have shared with our partners. And please understand getting into new category of business and when you get a reference product and you develop the product, you then have to share with your partners they do their own research and then they come back depending upon what potential the product has. So that is a process which is on. That is point number one and, and that as and when happens we'll be more than happy to share. Equally, the business development work that we are trying to do is to add more partners because we have enough capacity in terms of 
the lozenges that we can make and look at working with more partners across the globe, maybe in the eastern part of Europe, some parts of Russia, some parts of Southeast Asia. So there are some more partners where dialogues have been on. So as and when things proceed, we'll be more than happy to share with all of you. Uh, just to share with you, uh, racket we started uh, for their brand called Stepsil in Australia as a market. Now we are looking at opportunity with racket in Russia, in Southeast Asia. So that is how things happen. But this business has got its own gestation period that has to be understood. We were fortunate enough that we could see a good uptake because of the, because of supposedly uh, more a seasonal flu type cough and cold season, which probably has has happened uh, in, in, in Western part of the world, in where our partners are in Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, Russia, where we, where our partners uh, sell these products. And uh, this is what we want to do in the world of CMO. And we have got all the capabilities and we have got all the capacities. That is where I see that, and it's a differentiated entire approach where, where, where we, can, we can bring uh, enough opportunities on the table. And uh, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it takes time for any company to get into this scale of, of, of having partners whom we have been working for last now two, three decades and equally rightly also have the capacity to add more partners. And third part is to get into new new age portfolio uh, because what COVID has taught us that cough and cold will be more seasonal, but immunity, wellness, motion sickness, sleep disorders, these are the new areas where our customers are looking forward if this uh, this therapeutic delivery can come in the world of lozenges, which has to be overall low dosage form. Yeah. So, for, uh, so to double the scale from say 250 crores to 500 crores, uh, would you need uh, uh, very high investments, or you feel uh, uh, we already have the facilities at our disposal? We have the capability to capability to manufacture two billion lozenges across the year. Right now, our output is close is close to one billion plus. That is where we stand. So we have enough capacities. Yeah. Got that. Fair enough. Uh, another question was on these branded markets of Russia CIS. Obviously, uh, we had plans to launch two to three products every year, and obviously on the, on the OTC side, and they're on you know build on the legacy. Uh, but but how is the market shaping up currently? Because you know the larger distributors control control almost around 50% of the market. Uh, so given the current construct around Russia Ukraine, uh, how how is this market panning out? So. The way we've seen, uh, you know, quarter one pan out, it is not the strongest uh, sort of quarter for us because of the seasonality of the portfolio we offer. Uh, usually we start seeing traction towards, you know, um, July, August. So, you know, sequentially we do expect the traction to get better. And as far as the new launches are concerned, we are pretty much on path. So we haven't sort of made any change to our strategy on, uh, the, on that part of our business. Okay, and, and anything on South African generic market you would like to uh, contribute because it's a much less talked about market. I understand it's a smaller proportion of the overall schemes, but still? Like I mentioned uh, during the quarter, it saw upwards of 25% growth and both public and private business continue to do well. And our uh, focus there has really been to sort of, you know, scale up that subsidiary and it's uh, pretty much on track. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Neelam Punjabi from Perpetuity. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I wanted to understand if you can just uh, comment on your Russia business. Uh, how has it done during the quarter? So, like I mentioned, uh, this is not the strongest quarter for Russia because of the portfolio that we carry. This is usually a bit of a leaner quarter, uh, but the demand has held steady uh, year on year. So I think the business overall hasn't sort of seen any deterioration or headwinds. And as we now get into Q2, and as you know, we start getting for the cup and cold season, uh, et cetera, it should start seeing better traction from this quarter onwards. 
and on the receivable side uh, also we seen decent traction in the last quarter what did that help you uh, my second question is on your pad so if i look at um, over the last two years our revenues in uh, ebitda have grown quite well but on the pad level we are largely flat which is understandable given the is of course uh, higher depreciation due to acquisitions and uh, loss of treasury income but going forward uh, what's the uh, trajectory that we can see in terms of earnings growth see on let me just explain you i think a little bit more conceptually as how we look at it as a management team when we started this journey on acquisition we had a cash of about 700 odd crores it was earning us about 50 crores a year we have invested it in a business called sandline which you know we brought a bit of about 50 crores a year we feel that you know this 50 crores in the next 4 to 5 years can become 100 crores right that's our hypothesis and that was the whole logic of buying this business so we personally feel that while yeah there will be a depreciation hit and you know the treasury income has gone away but we created a more sustainable you know income stream and a cash flow stream for the company and you know given today's age in uh, world where you know our treasuries across the board are struggling with varying yields and you know currencies and interest rates moving up and down i think this whole strategy served us better that's how we look at it as a management team and to your question on pat i think if i look at it from a sequential basis now esop costs are largely stabilizing and you know as we move into q2 q3 of the year they will sort of become comparable with the base as well because the base also carries esop costs and some of the treasury income also will get normalized so you will start seeing the benefit of a beta growth also into pat growth so i think you have to bear for one or two more quarters and you will sort of start seeing a upward trajectory on the pat as well got it um and if we look at our roc uh, you know they've come down from 42% to 22% given the acquisitions uh do we see uh, this roc number going back to the historical levels as the growth from senzyme and uh, the acquired portfolio comes in so i think when i look at you know 42 i think i personally feel 42 was coming on a back when probably we were not investing as much into acquisitions and the business right and a lot of our sort of pat etc was being driven by treasury income will we go back to 42 maybe no but can we get back to 30 35 over the next 3 to 4 years for sure but i just want to caveat this understanding this also depends on overall you know our m&a strategy and you know sort of the investments that we may choose to make so that will come and explain to you you know as and when those opportunities arise but with the portfolio we have as of today can we go back to 30 35 for sure got it and so you given a guidance of uh, 24 to 25 26% ebitda margin this year uh, do we start seeing our historical uh, fy21 27% margin level starting next year see very neela very <clears throat> difficult to talk about next year because we understand the guidance that we are given giving is on the basis of the volatile world that we are living into at some given right now we are seeing some some tailwinds in the in the case of uh, commodities in the in the case in the case of freight stabilizing but if you look at still there are pressures in terms of gas in terms of fuel in terms of currency volatility in terms of rlpm procurement for some specific products so net net what we are looking at that how overall the ebitda margin should flow from delivering market bidding growth that is the intention going ahead and we we are building a organization which is more future ready which is more into progressive portfolio never we have launched new products in the world of row market you will see us launching new products in the world of row market next year which are more progressive in nature which are more in the world of cardiology diabetology so those all need investment equally we now have a team of two and a half thousand people on the ground in terms of if we have if if what earlier was spoken that the payback period has to be sub six years so we have to make the right investment in terms of how do we drive better prescription traction and and from 2 crore if we have gone to 4 crore prescription why not to aspire for 6 crore prescription in the coming time by making right investment 
So we are looking organization from a theme of invest to grow. That is what is the intention. And equally, huge opportunity in terms of what we are trying to do in the world of CMO business, where there are new proof of concept which are developed, which are which are in the in the entire uh, journey of development. So these all things will play as and when things stabilize. Once things stabilize, we'll be able to give better direction in terms of what trajectory of EBITDA margin we are looking at. And we plan to do sometime that in quarter three, as we see, as we see, as we see things normalizing. Got it. Just one last question on my end. Uh, given we have acquired uh, Dr. Eddie's um, like uh, pediatric portfolio for brands, and our uh, current depreciation uh, as of Q1 is 26 crore. Uh, how much will it go up going forward? This will, uh, the DRL acquisition will not impact too much. The annualized impact of that portfolio will be about 5 crores a year. Got it. Thanks a lot for answering my question. That's it for my end. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we take the last question for today from the line of Rahul Jiwani from IFL Securities Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Thanks for taking my follow-up. Uh, now, this 57% prescription growth, which we have indicated for the quarter, does that include Sanzheim and Asmada as well? Uh, and if yes, can you please uh, talk about how our organic prescriptions would have grown? Uh, 